Sorry. Thank you, Gary. Sorry. Well, we're almost there. I uh, forgot one announcement, and i got to give it to you, or I'm going to get in trouble in Cat's Church. The giving tree, all right? That's out there as well in the, in the worship center. would love for you to, to take a tag off of there and, uh, and see what the gifts are and then bring them back, and you bring them back unwrapped, all right? There's just a lot of, a lot of opportunities for us to, to be used by God to work in people's lives today. Hey, you're sitting in my chair, man. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> I keep my concentration here now. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you all for joining us, especially you on, on live stream. And uh, um, you're going to get a chance today to see a little clip of, of Follow the Star. We'll be talking about that. But I want to, we'll be getting a new series. And the series going through Christmas is called Expect the Unexpected. Expect the Unexpected. And um, what we're going to be talking about are some biblical characters um, who had some unexpected visits from angels. Um, some who had some unexpected callings from God, things that God wanted them to do. We're going to talk about a, a few unexpected twists in some of the stories in the Bible. and What does that mean for us? How does that change our perception? And we're going to be talking about unexpected transformations in people's lives, some in the Bible, but mostly about right here. Some transformation that's happened in some of us and the trans transformation that God is going to make happen through this production coming up, Follow the Star. But before we get to that, we're going to look at two biblical characters that most of you are, are familiar with who had some radical transformations. Only one was an unbeliever, and the other was a believer, but he was weak in his faith. He needed to be stronger. So the title of today's message is God Will Show Up. He will show up. Expect the unexpected. And the first character is Saul. It's from Acts chapter 9, 1 to 16. I'm not going to put the words on the screen. You can just listen to them, but I'm going to walk us through this. If you've got your Bible, that's great, or you can write these down in your notes and, and read them later. But Saul was an unbeliever. He was a Jew. He was a persecutor of Christians, as many of you know. Um, hated the Christians. Did everything he could to take them out. To take them out. He, he believed that he was self-righteous, that he was going to get to paradise or heaven or whatever he believed in that because he was good enough. Because he was more zealous for righteousness than anyone else. That's who Saul was. The text reads this way. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked them, asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's the Christian movement, all right? Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, all right? Whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So he's out to pick up Christians. If you remember, just uh, two chapters before this in uh, Acts 7, Stephen was stoned to death because of his faith in Jesus Christ, and more than that, because of how he was proclaiming it to people. And, um, and Saul was there, standing with his arm out to hold their cloaks so that their aim would be better as they threw their stones at him. That's who Saul is, not a good guy. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I think that was unexpected, <laughs> don't you? If that happened to me, that would be unexpected, absolutely. But here's what's really cool about this. He goes on to say, who are you, Lord? Now, some people will say, well, that means he must have known who it was. I'm not sure about that because, because we talk about, you know, I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You know, this is master. And, and, and Saul just got humbled. This arrogant, self-righteous man was on the ground. He hit the deck, and he's calling this voice his master. All right? Now, if that's true, then how unexpected was the response he got? I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. I have risen from the grave. I'm real. Stop killing people because they believe in me. Okay, he didn't say all that. I just added it, but you know, he had to be thinking all that. <laughs> um, you know, he says, it goes on to say, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. 
God doesn't ask people things. He tells them things. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. Well, wouldn't you? All right? Because they heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened up his eyes, he could see nothing. Another unexpected deal. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. How humbling. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. A little PTSD. <laughs> this guy was traumatized. Convicted. Com out there killing Christians, calling them a bunch of phonies and fools because they believed in a risen Jesus. And he just got hit upside the head with Jesus himself. That had to be humbling. It goes on to say in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, unexpected. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord says this. He says, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias says, I have heard many reports about this man. <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> You know, he didn't say that exactly, but he meant that. <laughs> and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, okay, we'll talk about it. No, he didn't say that. He said, go. Go. This man, check this out. This man who was killing Christians. That's why he was where he was right now. Jesus says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name wow and so Saul becomes Paul, Paul. the apostle Paul greatest evangelist in the world crazy huh that's what transformation will do when we allow God to do it. But sometimes he's just got to hit us upside the head, right? How many of you have had that happen to you? Yeah. You know, God doesn't normally come to us like that. He normally comes to us through his word, reading his word, or, 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 or somebody's reading his word to it. It's his word, you know, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, which brings us to faith. The waters of holy baptism, you know. But, but here... I mean, God, that's the box he gives us in the Bible about how he operates, but he can come to us any way he wants. He's God. And that's how he comes to Saul. He needed it. <laughs> he needed that much in his face. That's the first one, first character, Saul, who became Paul. Second one is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Most right, he gets a bad rap, by the way. I mean, they're all doubting. Jesus showed up to the other 11. He just wasn't there, all right? So he's one of the 12, it says, uh, he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So when the other disciples told him, hey, we've seen the Lord, he says, no, no, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and the wound in his side, I, I will not believe. Well, a week later, the disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. I love this. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. That's unexpected, don't you think? All right? And said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand. Put it to my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas, it doesn't say this, but I think he did this, fell on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. And you know what Jesus didn't do? Correct him. Because he was speaking truth. He was his Lord and his God. Pretty cool. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet they believe. And then this section of scripture closes with these words. This, this is the purpose of the Gospel of John, all right? Jesus performed many other signs, which are always oftentimes unexpected, right? In the presence of his, of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why these words were written. And what was written in here is what we are bringing to life out there in just four more days. Four days. So that the word of God will cause people to believe in Jesus as their Savior. I share these two stories with you because um, and the Bible is full of stories like this, but in the hope that over these next few days, we will all become keenly aware of, of two things. Thousands of people 
Thousands and thousands of people are going to be walking through our campus in just four more days. Some will be driving through the parking lot. Most will be walking right through here. Right through here. Some are going to be unbelievers and need transformation. Some are going to be believers, but we can need to be strengthened. That's the first thing. Be aware of that. The second thing is that God will use his word. He will use his word through us as his delivery system. All right? That's what this is all about. To do what? To convict, like Saul, and convince, like Thomas, those who are weak, of the reality that there is a Savior who means what he says and what he did on that cross and from that grave. Expect the unexpected. And now, know, know, that, know that God will use you. That's what I want to get across today more than anything else. God will use you in ways that sometimes seem over-the-top excessive. You know, things being asked of you maybe that you don't think should be expected of you. But that's what's going to happen for most of you who are involved in this production. You're going to be called to sacrifice your time, your, your energy, likely your money, because many of you are going to be taken off of work just to be a part of this production. You're going to be asked to do far more than what maybe you think the expectation should be. And for those of you not directly involved, you're not off the hook. Because if you're a part of this family here, you pray. You pray for those who are involved. Pray for their health. Pray for their safety. Pray for their humility. To, because that's what it takes to be used by God. And pray for all the people who are coming through. Pray, pray, pray. God will use you and use your prayers for his sake. Is that a lot to expect? Yeah, but we've done it before. Four times. Four times. Four years now we've proven that through rain, wind, and ice, 18 degrees, year two, remember that? And Jesus and a loincloth on the cross. Way to go, James. We've proven that we are willing to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes so that this community can see the gospel of Jesus Christ come to life right before their very eyes. And here's what's so cool about it. When we were a part of this kind of production, we get to see it too. Some of you are going to see people transform from unbelievers to believers right before your eyes. Some of you will. I know you will. Most of us, we're going to see with our own eyes because they're going to tell us how people have changed, been strengthened in their faith. And you know what the number one reason is, what they say? And I've got letters to prove it. <laughs> it's because they got to see the whole story. It wasn't just a baby in a manger. It's the whole deal. His life, his death, and his resurrection. That's cool. Whether you're portraying Jesus on the cross, and we've got 13 of you involved as Jesus somewhere, or whether you're portraying Judas in the betrayal scene. We've got a few of you too. <laughs> whether you're serving co cookies and hot chocolate or you're out there parking cars. Whether you're outside with the greeters, greeting people, praying for people, or you're inside serving the people here in wardrobe and, and makeup. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're driving through the production or whether you're at home praying for the production and, and, and for God's word to do exactly what he says it will do. He says it will not return void, but it will accomplish what I desire and for which I purpose it. Every one of us here has a part to play in that, though. We are his instruments, and God wants to use you. He will show up, expect it, even if it's unexpected, even if the dominator goes out. Or the donkey goes down. <laughs> or the camels show up late. <laughs> or a little boy whose mom's dying of cancer goes through on the golf cart and reaches into his pocket and gives me three dimes and a penny for the production so that more people can know Jesus just as his mom came to know her. That's just... Uh, this is your 23 of, of this production. It's your five here. Who would have thunk you'd be where you are in this production? How many of you are amazed at what you're doing in this production? 
Yeah, how many of you came up to me and go, I can't be that, I can't act, I can't do this, I can't do that. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> 300 people. Even more than that this year. How many of you remember when I first cast the vision for this? How many of you remember when that was? I'm so glad you could, I should have called you because I couldn't remember. I'm, I'm like, I mean, I know what year it was, but I was trying to find the sermon itself because okay, I wanted to reread it and kind of get back. It's, this is fifth year anniversary, you know? I finally landed on it, but I should have called up Stephen earlier because I, I called up Stephen to talk about something else. And I said, hey, do you remember? He goes, oh, yeah, it was Christmas Eve 2011. Then I called up Matt and said the same thing. I'm like, everybody knew it but me. Anyway, so what I did was I took that message, and I have some excerpts. I just want to share these with you, so I'm going to read them from that message five years ago. <coughs> i got to tell you, I've seen some pretty cool nativity scenes, and I've seen some of the most magnificent Bethlehem pageants, pageants anywhere in the world during Christmas, except one place. And here's how one church has been doing it in a production called Follow the Star. And so we played a PowerPoint that had about 20 slides, 13 scenes in, in Southern California at that church. <coughs> Excuse me. And we played that, and at the end of that, I said, let me tell you why I know so much about this production, Follow the Star. It's because that was the church I pastored for 13 years, and we created the life of Christ 18 years ago, and they just completed their 18th production two weekends ago. And then they stopped, by the way. So we had to pick it up. I've seen with my own eyes people's lives transformed. I've seen with my own eyes people come to know Christ as their Savior through this production. I have. I have. I've experienced the giving of people to those in need in the community through this production. Absolutely. 13 tons of food just here in, in four years to Hill Country Community Ministry. I've personally experienced the unity the unity that this event, event can bring to a church. And that's what we need here. Five years ago. That's what we needed. Now we got it. Right, right? Every year since I've been here, four years now, I've considered rolling this out as an idea for our church to bring to Texas. And each year something came up that just made me think, now's not the time. It's just not the time. But now it is. I believe that. I know it is. I mean, hey, we may not have the new building yet, but we got the parking lot. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> Let's use it for the community. It's like, look, I'm asking you, people of Good Shepherd, and those of you who aren't, who are here, you want to do something this community has never seen, all of Austin's never seen. You want to unwrap this gift for this community to see who that child in that manger really is next December? Then join me. Join us as we make this follow the star happen here. Now is the time for us to step up and outside of ourselves to join together to meet the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of the people in our community like never before. Now is the time for us to brand this church with being a people of God who live a life that begs the question. And the question this begs is, why do you have the crucifixion of Jesus during Christmas? And the answer is, because people need to know what? The rest of the story. This child isn't just some cute little baby in a manger. He's our Lord and Savior and our King. And to him, we can lead this community through Fall the Star. That was five years ago. You know, after that service, that's when somebody came up to me and said, my wife and I want to give a matching fund of $15,000 to kick this off. That's how it all started. Praise God. And now here we are. Has it worked? Have you seen people's lives change? Has yours? Because of this? Through this? Last year, I, um, I read a Facebook comment, and I, I showed it to you. It's this one here. Um, somebody wrote in, this is big. It's the best in Texas, maybe the best in most of USA. And my response was not just the best, it's the only. The only production in this country, maybe in the world, that at this time of year celebrates Christmas not only with the nativity scene, but ten scenes in the life of Jesus Christ, including his death on that cross and resurrection from that grave. Expect the unexpected. Because God has shown up big time. I have the letters, and the cards, personal testimonies to show you. But the vision I've had for many years to follow the star isn't just to keep it with us, just with one church at a time, you know, but to take this out across the nation 
for other churches to put this on. People come to faith in Jesus. It's the word of God. It's the gospel. And it comes to life. They get to see it, hear it, smell it, feel it. There's nothing more real than this. Well, I got to tell you, people are starting to, to get the idea. Next year, next December, Fall of Star is going to be put on in Florida. Shea Pennington is going to take the lead of that. <clears throat> Next year, I got a good friend coming down with about 30 people to watch this production, and maybe they'll be here for worship on Sunday. Um, they want to bring it to Kansas and use a community of churches, Lutheran and others, to put this on. Now, I don't know how they're going to do it in Kansas in December, but <laughs> maybe it'll have to be indoors. I'm not sure, but okay, but one last thing. Um, so... There was a family um, at my, my church in Southern California that, who were Filipino, and, and the parents never got citizenship. Very hardworking people, I mean, and they, they tried, 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 spent thousands of dollars on attorneys, and just, it, it didn't work out. And um, anyway, the dad was sent back to the Philippines. He's been there 10 years now. I got to know him very well, because every Christmas Eve, he'd, he'd, he'd make us a meal. Yeah, spicy shrimp and salmon, stuff like that. He knew what I liked. And, and it's just a neat guy, Manny is his name. And two months ago, he emailed me and said that his pastor wants to uh, put it on at their church. I'm uh, not the church, at, in a parking structure in Manila of the Philippines. Praise God for that, huh? So I'm going to work with him on that. And I guess, guess I'm going to have to go and consult. <laughs> more and more people. Are, are, are beginning to see the importance of helping people know the rest of the story. They gotta know who that baby is, guys. They gotta know who he is. I'll never forget that, that story about that little girl, seven, nine years old, standing at the cross, the crucifixion scene, and she's crying and her mom says, what's, what's wrong? And she says, that man, that man <laughs> is that baby. She got it. That child isn't just some cute little baby in a manger. He's our Lord. He's a Savior. He's our King. And to Him, we can lead people in this community to follow the star. God will show up. And some people's lives will be transformed. Expect it. But then again, <coughs> expect the unexpected. We're going to watch that clip. In 2015, follow the star. <laughs> 